Dr. El Shabini has a PhD in aerospace engineering, uh, I believe from West Virginia University. Um, he, has, he has a long career in both business and academia, and, I, and I'm assuming now some of it's in, even in the nonprofit world. With, with, um, he's the founder of Enneagram Egypt, uh, which I think he's also president of it. And um, he, he lives in Cairo, Egypt. Um, just to kind of give a little tie in, um, the, you know, this is a spiral dynamics integral group, which uh, deals not just with spiral dynamics, but particularly with the, the Ken Wilber Aqual model. And embedded within the Aqual model is, uh, you know, not just um, all. Um, levels and um, quadrants, but uh, also types. And of course, Enneagram is, as you all know, is one of the predominant uh, and well, most more well, well respected type personality types that is taught around the world. So I'm gonna, I guess, before I leave, I'm gonna ask everybody. It looks like most everybody's already muted themselves. And so I will mute myself and um, and turn it over to Dr. El Shabini. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction and thank you uh, for this lovely group for inviting me over today. Uh, I would appreciate, as Paul said, if the mics are off and the and I would love to see as many cameras as possible, but I understand, of course, not everyone can open the camera, but always lovely online to have an audience it makes it more uh, more human. There is a greater connection. Uh, so uh, lovely to be with you all. I'll give an introduction to uh, to my teachings, the Enneagram, and what goes with it, and how it connects to the integral uh, model in general. Uh, I'll try to limit it within an hour. I'll do my best. Please, Paul, if I start flying and lose my myself, just give me a five minute heads up and I'll uh, start to wrap up. And then we'll be open for questions. I'll be with you for as long as you want. Uh, online is, uh, is a nice environment which allows us to preserve the energy and meet from all over the world. And I think that what's happening in the world right now is, uh, is a ground for a new shift in collective consciousness. It's, we were ready for a new move and this is the push, but let's keep that to the end. And let's start from the beginning. I'll start by introducing myself and introducing my little journey. What got me here? How am I today in this place with whatever uh, introduction Paul was mentioning about me so diverse? So why am I talking about the Enneagram and the integral model today? Uh, it's usually where I like to start. I'll try to limit it to a, as few minutes as possible. Uh, and of course, uh, other than the vanity in it of showing off what I know, it's, <laughs> it's actually a main part of uh, what I will be talking about later. Because it will show from which angle I am approaching the Enneagram and the integral model and the models that I have created to connect them together. So, as Paul mentioned, I have a PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering from West Virginia. I have a master's in environmental sciences. I have an MBA in research and technology management from a German university. And I'm currently finishing a master's in transpersonal psychology from Liverpool, John Moores. So very diverse uh, studies, as you see. And they just for me, when I look back at this, I, I mean, except for the, for the master's in psychology, which I'm still doing, the rest, I call it the past. It was like as if it's another life. But just by looking at this, you'll see that there was a, a journey of seeking, seeking meaning, seeking value. I see that in everything that I would go into, I would take it all the way to the end. And when we talk about the Enneagram types in a while, you'll see which type usually does that. I would take it all the way to the end. And then at the end of the road, I would just stop and ask myself, what was all this for? Does it really have any value in it? And then I would say, okay, maybe the value is in this path. Maybe the value is in this path. As an engineer, 
it was a bit uh, strange. It was known even among my peers in the university that I was always into psychology and philosophy. I remember the day I entered to my father and I told him, okay, I'm leaving engineering. I'm going to philosophy. He almost had a heart attack and I was not allowed because <laughs> he was the one paying the, the bill. <laughs> so I had to go on. And although this might have delayed me two or three decades to get back to psychology and philosophy once again, but it's all integrated in what I do today. So I see the value of it, the, the big picture of it. And it wasn't until about nine or 10 years ago that I really started having a, uh, I would say an existential crisis. I reached a point where, okay, so what is the meaning of all this? I'm now a professor in the most reputable universities in the country. I'm an advisor, science advisor, nominated for cabinets. I have, uh, I've helped initiate the Egyptian Space Agency as a space engineer. I have been the foremost renewable energy scientist. So what? And now when I look back, it was some kind of finding that I had reached, I think, in my late teens, in my university years, where I realized that anything finite, I would consider has no value. Real value is in something that can stay, some, the infinite, the change. What I would get to learn from Ken Wilber later is this continuous progress of consciousness that's happening in the universe. This is really where value is, where you can just add something that will remain forever, even if you don't remain forever. This is your fingerprint. This is what you were sent here for. This is what this great, huge organism, this magnificent system, put you on Earth to do a job about. And this will link directly into the Enneagram in a moment. So that's when I started discovering new fields I hadn't heard about in my engineering career, even with my readings in philosophy and psychology. I started hearing about uh, NLP. I started with Reiki and NLP and family constellations. And as usual, I would grab the, the, the thread of any one of these and take it to the end. No, 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 not yet. This is not it. Until within just a few weeks apart, I discovered the two models that would definitely, I would say, change my life and calm my heart. And Ken Wilber, the integral model, in addition to some other models beside them. And this is when I started, let's say, building my own map of how things look like, how, how the whole process looks like. And I remember at that time, and this is very old, I put it into like a five step process. That I was with enlightenment, but maybe you can see it like a type of awakening, a five step process that I had to follow. I was putting a methodology for myself. And the first step is presence. Knowing yourself deep inside and being able to build a capacity to observe yourself and observe what's really happening. Later, I would call it connecting your inner world with your outer world. I realized that as long as we're not present, we have a separation between two very different worlds, the outer world and the inner world. This is an integral group, so the right-hand quadrants and the left-hand quadrants. They're totally split, totally separate. But once we get to know ourselves, our drives, our motivations, our values, our wounds, we know what's happening inside us, then we get to connect these two worlds. We realize that they're just mirroring each other. Neither of them is a cause and effect. And this is what at a higher stage later mystics would call a union where everything connects in one. Now, once you get to know yourself, you're present to yourself, you're present to your inner capacities and you keep on increasing your sense of presence, then comes the really heavy task of inner work. Inner work is the modern psychological world, I would, word I would say, the shadow work of Carl Jung, the uh, cleaning up of uh, Ken Wilber, what the Sufis used to call the sense of purification. You're purifying yourself from the, from the drives, these hidden shadows, the dark places, the demons, as the Buddhists call them, and the ghosts, as the Chinese call them. All these things you need to just get to know and clean. 
without knowing what to clean in the first step, you're really lost. I remember Ken once saying that if you don't have your inner knowing, then you could spend 20 years of meditation and you don't really know what you're trying, what you're looking for. It doesn't really make much difference. So this is this inner work process. And once you have the capacity to clean, you're cleaning up energy. You're cleaning up if, if, yeah. We could get everyone to mute so you're on, free the, on the line. That would be great. Thanks. And once you start freeing up this space, now you have the available energy for expansion. And this expansion allows for higher perspectives and the ability to hold higher perspectives together. And these three points out of the five, I find no model better than the Enneagram to satisfy these three. So this is now where we're going into the Enneagram. In all my search and everything that I've done, the Enneagram is profoundly powerful in taking you through these three steps. And then the fourth step would be a sense of human maturity, the integral levels on the spiral, let's say, where you develop your cognitive capacity and higher complexity that allows you to integrate all these perspectives that you are capable of perceiving in the expansion level. The Sufis have a word they always say, expand your heart, expand your heart, expand your chest, actually, the word is. And as a young teen, always, you know, always hot, always believing in oneself, oh, there's all these narcissistic powers. What is this expand yourself? What is this expand your chest? It's this maturity, it's this ability to relax in the state you're in and hold all these different perspectives together. And then finally, a sense of transformation, a sense of essence realization. This process is not linear although we tend to think in a linear way. And this is again where this model of a spiral comes in, not the spiral, but a spiral, the spiral being the spiral dynamics or the spiral dynamics integral, but a spiral because they all feed each other and we keep on growing. It's not stay with presence until you're ready and then you get a degree in presence and then you move on to inner work. No, they're all feeding each other all the time going around. For the people who are visual, and I've been learned teaching myself lately to serve for the visual people because I'm a bit auditory, you have the presence. And I like, I love this picture because I, I have a pet cat and I just enjoy looking at how she can sit on a beanbag for hours in a total sense of presence. It is like the perfect teacher of presence and meditation is my pet cat, just sitting there present to the moment. It is just lovely. It raises your energy, it raises your frequency, expands your heart, just to look at these present animals at the moment and realize how we are causing all this suffering and this reactivity to ourself when we're not present. This is where the Enneagram will come in very powerfully. And then comes the inner work and the shadow work and integrating the dark and the light, integrating the thesis and the antithesis, what we like to call in the Enneagram world, the law of three, where you can reach the synthesis through balancing and integrating the thesis and the antithesis, the two polarities. This is where finding your light and your dark together and realizing the power in both of them, that nothing is pure good and nothing is pure bad. Everything comes with this advantage and its disadvantage. And it's this power of seeing them both together that helps you grow. Many Zen masters in my life, and they were all cats. Eckhart Tolle, oh, that's beautiful. Beautiful, Simon. So, and then this sense of expansion, holding the perspectives. And although I put the Enneagram symbol here, but actually the Enneagram symbol helps us in all the, these three steps. And the fourth one, this maturity is highly aided by the spiral dynamics or spiral dynamics integral. And I will be using the spiral colors. So for those familiar with Ken's colors, I might sometimes mention the others might not, but 
but I, I'm more familiar, I'm, I'm more used, I know them both, but I'm more used to using the spiral colors. It comes easier, more natural with me. And then finally, the, fast, the last step is this transformational process, this sense of becoming much greater in capacity and finding this change of states, moving into higher states of being, realizing this oneness, this connection between everything together. Now, I might sometimes sound a bit mystic. I'm sorry for that. I do now. I mean, for a while, for like seven, eight years, I was always not finding a way to describe myself. Someone would ask me, so who are you? Oh, I'm a professor. I'm a this. I do this. Right now, I just make it easier and say, I think I'm becoming a mystic. So excuse my mystic language sometimes, and I'm open to questions in that, in the Q&A uh, at the end. So knowing this, I, I created programs. And while I was doing this, I spent like two or three years, actually, literally, not metaphorically, literally in the wilderness, in the mountains. I went to Sinai. I discovered this beautiful place in the mountains of Sinai, very close to Mount Moses. And I would spend months there. And uh, I just felt my heart going with that. And a transformation happened. And eventually, I never thought one day that I would be teaching this stuff. It was always filling up my holes. When I get to teach and I start, I always tell them I had a huge hole inside that nothing was filling, regardless of what I fill it with with achievements, achievements, with knowledge, with righteousness, with whatever I fill it with, it just gets bigger. It didn't really start to fill up, except when I really was able to be in a state of silence and solitude and stillness. And again, these directly relate to the Enneagram as we will see in a moment. And then I had a calling to teach. I actually had a group of people asking me, come and tell us about this crazy stuff you're talking about. So I started teaching them some of the crazy stuff and I started building up a program. And the first three steps of the program became what I call the Enneagram journey of awakening, or I call it awaken through Enneagram. So the Enneagram for me is a tool of awakening. It is a tool of really knowing everything about yourself layer behind layer behind layer behind layer from personality to psychology to spirituality or transformation and holding this perspective so these are the first three steps and the fourth step became this integral enneagram model that i created starting with what i call stages of the mind and this is what i'll talk about a bit today and then the stages of the heart. So these are these five steps I mentioned earlier in a very profound and deep process. And then I integrate all this in the quadrants and the lines. So by the time I go through these six, people are profoundly deep in both of these models. Now, I wanna say, what, why did I say all this? I mean, how long have I spent now? Maybe 10, 15 minutes. I've said all this because the Enneagram most of what people teach as the Enneagram in the world, and most of the books that you will find and the lectures that you will take, do not pass this first level. Nine, I would easily claim that 90% of what is found publicly about the Enneagram is just in this Enneagram of personality. And this is very, very dangerous, very dangerous. Uh, Mike said, embracing the void instead of filling it. Beautiful, beautiful. I totally accept that. Yes, and, and it, you can see it in so many ways. And uh, I, I have uh, this mystic quote of mine, which I say that zero and infinity are the same. On a global level, zero and infinity are the same thing. So uh, thank you, Mike, for that. So most of it is in this personality and the enneagram to be taken as a personality model is a very dangerous thing to do very dangerous i totally discourage against it because it be the enneagram is an extremely powerful tool again with all that i've studied i have not seen something as powerful as the integral model and the enneagram and the enneagram taken as a personality model turns into 
a model of separation, putting people in silos, judgment, labeling. It becomes, as one of my dear teachers and mentors, Tom Condon says, it becomes a tool, a weapon to attack others and an excuse to find ways out for yourself. And this is what happens when people just take the Enneagram as a personality model, just, just these things on the surface. So even in this first level, I already keep reminding people, we are all of these. We are all of these. This is the slide, if I find my cursor and then I find my slide. This slide I start every session with. You are all of these. You are one of these, and you are none of these. One sorry, of these Khalid. is your dominant type. Yes. Uh, sorry, Khalid. I, I think you're not sharing you a screen yet. Oh, I'm not sharing the screen, all this? Yes. I've been putting my slides and moving my slides. And <laughs> Thank you for telling me about that, because I had shared yeah, it and good. then we broke it off. Okay. Good news is telling you the bad news. Good news is the best news. Thank you for saving me good news. <laughs> so, very briefly, this was my first slide. I go over them in less than a minute. The slide with my uh, vanity slide, I call it. And then the slide with the five-step process where I had gone through them one by one. All of this in a circular, cyclical sense. Wow, so how are you following me, guys, without all these slides? I was referring to the slides all the time. I'm so sorry for that. <laughs> and then my five steps in a visual sense. The first step, the second step, the inner work, the third step, the expansion, the fourth step, the maturity through the spiral, and the fifth step. Yes, Tad, I will share the, the PowerPoint, no problem with that. Uh, and the fifth step, the transformational level, and then how I was showing that I put this into programs. So the Awaken Through Enneagram program is three levels, which take us through the first three steps, and then this integral Enneagram, which is my model that I'm introducing to the world now, is in integrating the Enneagram with the spiral in the stages of the mind and integrating the Enneagram with the mystic and Sufi and states and tradi spiritual traditions of the world in a profound level called the stages of the heart. And I've been presenting the stages of the heart in many conferences around the world. I believe Earl attended one of my sessions, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, the stages of the mind is what I'm now also presenting around. And I end all this with the uh, quadrants and the lines, and again, integrating all this with the Enneagram. I have a third program I didn't introduce, which is certifying people to become teachers and trainers in that, but that's out of our subject right now. And I said that I start before anything. So all this was to reach this slide where people have to realize before delving into the Enneagram, you are all of these, you are one of these, and you are none of these. One of these is your dominant type, how you've been programmed to function and to think and to feel and to act, what drives you to become who you are in this world. But remember, you are all of these. We are not separate. We're all connected, and you have all these drives within you. So any type you're labeling, any type you say I'm irritated from, I don't like, or even you say I like, this directly points to shadows and work you need to do inside. Because you're all of these. You have more. You're one of these. You're way beyond that. You're much greater than that. This is a type you have. You're not your name. You have a name. You're not your type. You have a type. And that takes us now to in introducing the Enneagram through this mentality. Now, you have to realize that the Enneagram is, I don't call it a model as much as I call it a living being. It's a living organism. 
it's all the time bringing wisdom and bringing insights to the world. And that's why the knowledge of the Enneagram is changing, is increasing, is expanding, is transforming all the time. And as more and more people put their hearts in it, more and more mysteries are revealed from it. That's why I always like to say, this is the Enneagram according to my school, to my background, to my understanding. This is how I see it, this is how I teach it, and this is how, thankfully, I've been transforming lives with it. So, I like to start with what's called the intelligence centers, because this directly relates to the human being. As humans, we have three centers of intelligence, and again, nothing is linear. This is just classifying the non-classifiable creating segments of something that is actually all connected. We have a thinking center. We have an emotional feeling center. And we have a sensing body center. Each one of us has these three main centers. Neurologically, they're all in the head, okay, but their energy centers are in the forehead, around the center of your heart or your torso and down in the gut. These are the three centers. And each one of them basically is assigned a main function, is here to do a job. And the three work simultaneously. They work together all the time, receiving inputs from outside and from inside. And transforming these signals into their own language. So what is the language of the thinking brain? It is what we call the mind, the brain. We take the thinking brain to be our only intelligence center in our current society, in our current civilization right now. Language, abstraction, creating strategies, making meaning out of things, creativity, classification, innovation. Instead of creativity, I would actually replace it now with innovation. Creativity would more to be towards the second center now. All this I summarize in one center, analyzing the past and the present to keep me safe and secure in the future. So it's a future thinking center. And then we have the emotional brain. And this is what deals with emotions, memories, pre-programmed habits, creating value, compassion, connection, bonding, seeing others. It is this brain that creates human beings and live entities, live animals and live plants out of the others. Without this center, if we're just with the head and the gut, everything around us are just objects. We just navigate objects. It's really by waking up this emotional center that we get to see others. And we get to see this connection between us and the others. And this connection creates roles, creates value, creates image, creates a sense of how am I seen? And the third center is the sensing brain. This is where we get the life force, the power to act, to move, mobilization, to preserve ourselves, to protect ourselves, the courage to go on with all the threats in the world, the fight, flight, freeze, and fawn reactions that make me survive in the moment. It's more in the present moment and a reaction to the present moment, the gut brain. I get a sensation and I react to it. And the fastest of these is by far this gut sensing brain. The sensing brain is 10 to 100 times faster than the emotional brain, which is another 10 to 100 times faster than the thinking brain. And all of them are seeking our safety and survival. This is, this is the core uh, element inside. I never realized that, that they correspond to Beck and Cohen, by the way. I never looked at it that way before. Uh, I'll, I'll have to think of that. So 
The gut brain reacts to the present moment, cares about personal space, seeks autonomy. The emotional brain reacts to relationships and others, cares about image, and seeks a sense of value. Again, this is extreme summary. I'm summarizing something huge here, but it's enough to give the message. And the head brain, the thinking brain, reacts to expected, expected threats in the future, cares about resources to survive in the future, and seeks strategies to guarantee survival in the future. Now, what happens when these centers, instead of being used as tools to serve the organism, take over the organism, hijack the organism? What happens when this one takes over, when the head thinking brain takes over, you are laden with a sense of fear and anxiety and you have problems with your power and your capability. You always fear, I'm not ready to face the future. And this creates a sense of anxiety inside and fear. The emotional brain, once it hijacks the process, and hijacks here means acting too much or too little. Sometimes this hijack comes in a sense of, I don't wanna feel my feelings, I don't wanna feel my emotions, I wanna push them away. Then you get a sense, a problem with a sense of shame. There's a problem in value. The value is not enough. And this creates also another sense of sadness. I'm using here the, the, the prime emotion, prime feelings, and a sense of sadness because a separation happens. And the sense of separation is a separation from the others, separation from life, a separation from the divine, a separation from your own self. And this creates an existential sense of sadness inside, a melancholy inside. And finally, the gut brain is led by anger. And it has a problem with boundaries. When you have a problem with the world, you have start creating too strong boundaries or too weak boundaries outside and inside. Now, if you look at these three centers, uh, these have been used in mystic tales in all of history. And I like to remind people of, uh, of one of the beloved stories and movies that most of us have known and seen so many times in our childhood, at least I have, The Wizard of Oz. And if you remember the three characters that Dorothy meets along her path on The Wizard of Oz, they were the scarecrow with a problem in the thinking center, the tin man with a problem in the emotional center, and the lion. Where is the lion? It's not coming. He's afraid. Yeah, it was about courage. And he, the picture doesn't want to come. Yeah, there he is. Come on, come out. So nothing is by coincidence, I guess. The lion and this problem with courage and having a gut and having the anger inside and be able to function. And if you remember all of these, in, even in the story, they all came together when the wizard told her, you've had it all inside you. You had it all within you. This is where the presence comes in. And this is the moment she wakes up back again in Kansas when she reintegrates her three centers. These were metaphorically representing Dorothy herself. So the journey is to realize these three and be able to balance them, even knowing that each one of us is pre-programmed to give priority to one of these three centers. This happens. This is the point of you are one of these. One of these leads you all the time. And if you are not present and aware and awake to what's happening, it takes over, it dominates, it controls, it becomes the master. And you are just the reactive slave to the energy of this center, reactive to the anger or to the shame and the sadness or to the fear and anxiety. And it's by understanding these dynamics happening inside you that you can be present to them 
observing them, and then you get dominance over them. This is the inner work comes here. Who's in control? Who's leading? And this finally takes us to the Enneagram symbol. And I've drawn on the symbol, the separations of these three centers. So up, we have this sensing body center. We have the emotional center. And we have the thinking center, which have dominant driving affects, driving energies, driving forces. I don't like to call them emotions or feelings as much as they are energy and force that's pushing you to become who you are. They're not bad or good. This is the big problem that we have to keep on dealing with people. These energies make you who you are. Without anger, there is no driving force. There's no action. There's no mobilization. You cannot really stand your ground. Without shame and sadness, there's no sense of human connection and bonding and empathy and compassion and love. And without this fear, there's no vigilance. There's no preparation. There's no innovation. There's no strategies for the future. There's no growth. So it's by being controlled by these at the start of your life, when you're a young adult, that you build who you are. But then with time, you need to move into using these energies, not being used by them. And when these affects control you, you have one of three choices. When you have anger in you, what do you do with the anger? Remember the first law of thermodynamics? Energy has to go somewhere. It doesn't, does, doesn't just disappear. It just changes form. So this energy of anger, what to do with it? You either express it, bring it out, get rid of it, dump it on those in front of you. And this is usually when we think of anger, we think of it this way. But there's another way of dealing with anger. Suppress it, drink it inside. Mm, I'm angry now, I'm boiling, but no, I have to hold it if I, give out this anger in front of my boss, he's going to fire me. I hate him. He's so bad, but I cannot open my mouth. I have to repress it and suppress it and push it in. And it creates a sense of resentment, a sense of wrath. And then the third way becomes escaping and denying it. Who's got anger? I don't have anger. No, no, I think you guys have anger. I'm calm. I'm peaceful. I'll just go to the movies. I'll just take a nap and when I wake up, everything will be fine. You distance yourself, you deny it, you disconnect from it. I like to find all the words that start with a D. I don't know why they all start with a D, but you deny and distance and disconnect and you just go away from it. I don't have it and it's boiling inside, but I don't feel it. And the same with the shame and the sadness and the same with the fear. So it's three, energies, three forces, and three ways to deal with each of these forces. Three by three is nine. We love the threes in the Enneagram world. Everything is based on threes. So three by three is nine. And these are the nine Enneagram types. One is controlled by expressing anger. And one by suppressing anger. And one by denying anger disconnecting. I don't have anger. One, by expressing. And expressing usually means projecting it outside. The problem is in you, not in me. I have to fix you. I don't need to fix me. What I need is outside. It's not inside. So that's expressing, dumping it outside. And the other inside, oh, the problem is in me. I have to fix me. I have to take care of me. A lot of interjection. And then the third one denying is there's no problem. Outside, inside, we don't want problems. Just, just get rid of this energy. Three by three is nine. These are the nine types. So basically, if we go around the circle, we have the eight is the type that expresses anger. Again, this is a very, very brief, as much time as we have. So the eight is the type that expresses anger. Now, before I go through the eight, the nine types, I have to note 
that how the type appears in the world depends more on the health level, the present level of presence, than it does on the type itself. So there is no good type or bad type. There is no type better than another type. It's all about how healthy you are, how present you are, your capacity for presence. This is, this is the magic word. How long can you hold presence before losing your presence and being taken over by the affect? So it's as if it's a sense of being present, which I call here essence, you can just put it there, present, or being dominated by a reactive ego. And depending on this level, you will be somewhere on this spectrum. And the Enneagram original teaching all plays on this spectrum. So in the head center, you're either fully present, then you get to see what we call the holy ideas. You get to see the magnificence of the system. You get to see how everything connects with everything. You get to see higher wisdom. But depending on your type, you will see different wisdoms. You'll see different meanings in life. While if you're totally taken over by your ego identification, by your type, by your anger or shame or, or anxiety or whatever, then you are in a fixated way of thinking. You have one way of thinking about the world and everything is analyzed from that specific way. Same goes with the heart center, the emotional center. You either have what has had so many names in the traditions. In the Christian mystic tradition, they're called the deadly sins. In the Sufi mystic tradition, they call them diseases of the heart. In the Chinese tradition, they call them the ghosts. In the Hindu traditions, they call them the demons. All these inner wounds of the heart, inner diseases of the heart, is what the Enneagram calls the passions. I call them like little fires inside that need to be fed. And the more you feed them, the more they fire up. They never get enough. These are these holes I was talking about. It's a hole that wants to be fed. And the more you feed it, the greater it becomes. You never have enough. But when you calm the heart, when you're fully present to these energies, then the best part of you comes out to the world, the greatest virtues, your greatest characteristics, what you were meant to be, your greatest gifts. I will end with a slide called the greatest gifts to start showing in the world. And the gut is about instincts, and that's a bit of a complex topic that I won't touch now, but it's the same thing. Are your instincts balanced or are they distorted? So from this, you get to realize that there is no good type or bad type. The eight expresses anger. When the anger takes over, you're down here. And when you're down here, you're acting from a fixation and passion of anger. You're aggressive, you're tough, you have no mercy. But when you move up the scale, you become the source of truth, the source of justice, the source of balance in the world. You protect the weak, you take care of the broken, you correct them and on a spiritual level, these become the higher names of the divine. You become the source of justice, of power, of leadership. The nine, the nine, the one in the center of the center is always the one that denies the energy, distances, the nine, the three and the six, this center triangle. So by escaping this energy, by denying this energy, the nine loses the power to act and mobilize. They lose the force field. Again, when we are controlled by denying the energy, 
When we're controlled by that, we deny our own powers. We deny our own boundaries. But then the nine was not meant to be that. The nine was meant to be the keeper of peace. The one that teaches us all to accept each other. They are the true source of love and harmony in the world. And then we go to the one. I'm going very briefly, of course, now over all of them. And then we go to the one. And the one, again, is in the gut. And this is the type that suppresses the energy, suppresses the anger. Something is wrong in my environment. And I have to look inside. So all of them are building on this main sense that we introduced in this slide. Something is wrong in my environment, in my boundaries. I have to act upon it. The eight, I have to correct it outside. The nine, I have to deny it. Nothing is wrong. Everything is okay. Accept it all. And the one, I have to correct myself. Something about me. And by correcting myself, I have the right to correct everything around me. This sense of righteousness. So the one becomes the source of morality, the source of righteousness, the source of always reminding us to be on the correct path. Again, each one of these has its light side and its dark side. The eight between justice and aggressiveness, and brutality, the nine between peace and forgetting ourselves and disconnecting from the world. And the one from morality and righteousness to becoming a resentful, wrathful, uh, self-righteous perfectionist. So both sides exist and it's learning to integrate them. And then that takes us into the hard types. And the hard types are about connection and about image. And with the lack of connection and image, it's the shame and sadness that's driving them. The shame and sadness in driving the two, the two projects it outside. So the problem is not in me, it's in all of you guys. I need to take care of all of you. I need to see your needs. I don't have any needs. I need to see what you need. I want to create a bond. Remember, it's all about bond and image. I want to create a bond and this bond will be created through making you need me. But it comes in the sense of care, of love, of attention, of seeing your needs. Again, when the ego takes over, there's a lot of intrusion into the private space of everyone. There is a lot of knitting, you know, a spider web and let you fall into it. But then when the two cleans up the process and disconnects, goes up into the higher essence, into the expansive side, they are the archetype of the mother, mother earth, mother nature, mother, the loving mother, the Madonna, the uh, uh, Mary, uh, the Isis in the, in the Pharaonic tradition, all this motherhood image. All these are archetypes, by the way. They're all archetypes. They're seen in the ancient Egyptian gods, they're seen in the Greek gods, they're seen in the Hindu gods, they're seen in the angels, in the monotheistic traditions, Christianity and Islam. These are the archetypes that build our characters, again, from a spiritual sense. So this is the mother, the two. And then the three is the one that denies that they have shame and sadness. And by denying shame and sadness, just like with the nine, they denied the anger, and with it, they denied the entire energy from the gut. So they collapsed. The, the three denies the shame and sadness, so they deny the whole power of emotions. And with denying the power of the emotions, they become a doer, a runner, seeking value through vanity, through image, through achievements, through being good. In whatever sense, good needs to be. So on the low side, vanity, we've all seen uh, Al Pacino in Vanity, my favorite sin. That was a very three-ish movie. Uh, what was it called? Uh, Devil's Advocate. And then on the other side, the three 
becomes, I say, the three have a golden finger. They touch anything, they turn it into gold. They know how to synthesize. They create value in the world. They are the center of the heart system. When they connect with their emotions, they become the most emotional type and they bring value in emotions to the world and they help raise everyone, bring everyone up. And then the four is the one that suppresses the shame, the sadness inside. So where is the problem in value? The problem in value is in me. Something must be wrong in me. Something is there that I need to discover. And that takes them into a, G, a deep inner journey of feelings and emotions. And they come out to the world with a sense of beauty, a sense of authenticity, a sense of letting us see the world in different eyes, seeing colors where there are no colors, smelling flowers, even in a dumpster. They just can find beauty in the darkness and they can find darkness in the beauty. Again, everything comes with its opposite. So when they are controlled by the lower side, when they don't have presence to themselves, they fall into a state of melancholy, a state of continuous deficiency inside and outside. Again, one of my basic rules, I have in all my teaching basic rules. One of them is we do outside what we do to ourselves inside. So this deficiency I find inside becomes a continuous sense of deficiency outside and nothing is ever okay. There's a continuous frustration going on with the world. But on the high side, these are, this is the poetry of the mystics, full of love, full of longing, full of melancholy to finding the true self and the true one and the truth behind everything, the reality behind everything. And they have this sense of incredible, uh, what would be called in English, resourcefulness in creativity. It's just finding something magnificent out there. And they can, and these three types, the two, the three, and the four, when they are healthy, they have a lovely gift of making us see the best within us and bringing out to the world the best that we can bring out. This is the role. They connect us to each other and bring out the beauty inside. And then we come to the five, six, and seven, the head types. And the five introjects the fear and anxiety. I'm not ready for the future, and that problem is in within me. And this brings a sense of a lack of resources and a lack of energy to face the future. It's about a sense of lack. And when you have a huge sense of lack and scarcity, you automatically hold on. But remember, it's not really about the resources outside. It's about the resources inside, a lack of energy, a lack of time. There's not enough time. There's not enough power. I'm weak. I'm small. I need to disconnect from the world and observe from outside. I need to not expend any energy and the fives dry out. These are these wise professors that are disconnected from life until we forget about them in their caves. But when the five grows to expand and they realize the abundance in the universe, their gift to the world becomes this capacity for wisdom, for clarity, for illumination. They become these knowledgeable, wise philosophers and scientists that change the world through these aha moments. They're looking for this, aha, I got it. And they tell us how the world runs. Six, disconnects, disconnects from its fear, disconnects from its thoughts, disconnects from its guiding power. And once I lose the sense of guidance, all the paths look the same. I can bring up all the possibilities. And then I get lost in the possibilities and anxiety comes up. I don't trust my own powers, although I'm very vigilant. 
I see everything and I can even imagine what's not here. So if this sense of vigilance and anxiety and disconnect from my guiding source is lost, I just panic and I need to hold on to something to give me safety and security. I need a powerful leader. I need uh, an organization. I need stability. I need security. I need something to predict the future for me. But once I reconnect and trust myself and trust my thoughts and find my guiding light, I become the source of loyalty, the source of trust, the source of vigilance, of awakeness, of solidarity, all for one and one for all, of standing together to face the problems of the world, and most of all, a sense of courage. John Wayne, I believe, used to say, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is being as frightened like hell, but getting on and riding to the battle. So this is what happens to the six. They know the dangers that happen, but they get up and face them. They take things in their own hands. And finally, the seven, this lack of resources, this lack of energy, this lack of safety in the future is projected outside. So now everything is outside and I need to grab it. I need options. I need spontaneity. I need freedom. I need to feel that I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. I need to be feeling expansion. When this takes over, the lack of resources outside takes over, it causes a sense of scattering. I call it the popcorn mind. The mind is full of popcorns, just pop, 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 ideas, ideas, jumping, 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 jumping. And with every popcorn that comes out, I have to go with it. I'm going with this thought, I'm just about to reach it, and then another corn pops in the other direction and I have to go with the other one and I have a lack of focus. You find the seven's eyes just rolling all over the place, thinking fast. They're the fastest thinkers. They're very fast, smart, very witty, but it takes them a lot of growth to be able to focus. And unfortunately in the psychological arena, lots of sevens get diagnosed as ADHD or ADD, attention deficit. And it's not to deny that there is something called ADHD, but most of the people, most of the children in schools that are uh, diagnosed as ADHD are actually just lovely, beautiful, a creative type seven children. And by giving them medication and by trying to break them, we're trying to make them deny what they were created for. They were created to bring the sense of freedom and sense of brightness to the world. You cannot see a seven and not smile. They just bring beauty, it's just happiness, joy. On the lower side, they try to create happiness and this becomes very distracting. But on the higher side, they are the manifestation of happiness and freedom and expansion and spontaneity, breaking the chains of the must. Now, by looking at this, you get to see that the seven, the nine types have great gifts to bring to the world. And you have to always remember your greatest gift and the greatest gifts of those around you. Because our psyche, our ego, so easily jumps to the negatives. When you say type eight, it's very easy to remember Genghis Khan or to remember Stalin or to remember someone that's leaving office these days, but, and holding on to it, okay. So it's very easy to remember these characters, but it's so much harder to remember the best people that came out of these types. In my part of the world, we have great reverence. We revere, highly revere the prophets of the holy books of the Bible and the Quran and the Torah. And so to remind people of how good these types are, I always remind them of these revered figures in history. So you have Moses, this strong type eight. And you have Muhammad, the source of peace in the nine. And 
you have Jonah with his righteousness in the one. And you go around and you have Jesus and Mary in the two. And you have Solomon with his achievements in the three. And you have Jacob in the four. And you have uh, Abraham in the five. And you have Aaron in the six. And so, and I don't remember the seven right now. I'm sorry. But uh, you have in the seven, I think it was Jonah lately in the seven. One was uh, who we call an Arabic tribe. I don't know his name in English. So you have these enlightened figures that all came to represent these higher figures. You get Confucius in the one, you get Lao Tzu and the Buddha in the five, you get, uh, so you can see all these people in all these places. And one of our dear teachers also, one of the uh, great mentors also in the, the world of the Enneagram, Hudson, always says, our ego is easy to identify with the lowest of each type, but always try to remember the best person you know of each type. Make that your archetype. It's so much harder, but with practice, it lifts you and everyone around you. So even if you don't have characters, remember these greatest gifts. The eight brings justice and power. The nine brings harmony, acceptance, and peace. The one gives, brings righteousness and morality. The two brings nurturing and care. The three brings value and meaning. The four brings beauty and authenticity. The five brings wisdom and clarity. The six brings loyalty and trust. And the seven brings freedom and lightness. And again, this is highly limiting the types, but just bringing out some of the lovely features in each. And already, as I said, you can see that these are archetypes. So. From there, I've tried to be as fast as I can because I wanted to give myself even five or 10 minutes to quickly introduce how this connects to the integral model. I hope I still have those, uh, Paul, as I told you, Paul, if I go too long, just give me a sign. So very briefly, I will show how these integrate with the spiral and with the states of consciousness. So we all know in the integral model, we have structure stages represented here by the spiral dynamics. We have the state stages. And Wilbur usually likes to use the states from the Buddhist tradition. I add a layer to them from the Sufi tradition. So how would each of these nine types look like from every one of these stages, the structure stages, and the state stages. How would they look like? And this is actually the research that I've been doing for several years with my hundreds of students by putting the theory, applying it to them, getting feedback from them, and then applying it again until it's matured into a model. And I, I've had the intention this year to be the publication year, to have some articles and papers and books. I've only been presenting this in conferences until today. So, in, a, in order to do that, in this short time, I prepared this very briefly on one type. And for some reason, I chose uh, type two. Type two was my father's type. So even though archetypally, we tend to give the types a feminine or a masculine, but every type can be a man or a woman. So that's also one of the advantages of talking about type two, which was my father. He passed away a few months ago, so like a dedication to him. I talk here about type two. And this loving, nurturing, caring type, I told you, I believe that this is, again, we do not know the types of others. Ah, I forgot to talk about this. Never go around typing another person. That is the biggest no-no. So what do we do from the stories of the past we say that most probably we see such and such features, but we don't know. So when I say that I believe that Jesus and Mary were type two, I don't know, most probably. Okay, someone living, someone in a relation with you, it's none of your business to type them. Never, you only find yourself. Your journey is to discover yourself. And when we started the day today, many of you mentioned that they had used some tools to find their types. 
Okay, it could be beneficial for some part or the other, but I totally discourage that. Even discovering your type is part of your growth process. If you need a type quickly for a business or an organization, okay, use a tool, but don't believe it. You can easily trick all the tools. You can actually write what you think you are, not what who you are. The tool might be confusing things together. Finding your type is your own personal self-discovery journey. And by revealing, by revealing your type, by discovering your type, you've already cut a huge path on the process of self-discovery. And you're allowed to, dis to change your type. There's no shame in saying I'm a four and then discovering, oh, no, no, I'm a, I'm a nine. I always say, we, sh we don't shame you when you change your type. We clap for you. Because changing your type means you know yourself better now. You've gone even deeper inside yourself. Some people discover their type in a minute. Some people take years to discover their type. Doesn't mean anything. Maybe just more awareness of the self. Some of the great teachers that I've even mentioned today say it took them a year or two to find their type. Others, as I said, take a minute or two. Uh, it took me a minute and a half to find my type. So it, it doesn't mean anything. It just depends on how Know how much you know yourself and how the Enneagram was introduced to you. So taking type two, and as I said, if I say Jesus was a two, who knows? It could have been an eight. Just the stories that we get, all this acceptance and love and nurturing and care and selflessness. How would the two look like? Ascending the stages of the mind. So what is the stages of the mind and the stages of the heart? This is what I call my model of combining the integral, the spiral dynamics with the Enneagram, stages of the mind, and the states, the Sufi states with the Enneagram, stages of the heart. So ascending the stages of the mind, let's look at type two, how most probably it would look like. It would start from the page as the primate mother. I'm just giving a name here, and then I'll give a description in a minute. So let's go directly to the descriptions. The beige, the primate mother. Now, I wish I had a picture of a, of a Homo erectus or a Homo habilis or something a bit more higher than the, than the chimp. But anyway, we don't have, so let's just consider the chimp right now. The mothering instinct, this emotional belonging to the species and the need to be needed in order to have a place, having a role. And this role is given to me in the group, this survival role, this, I, I call the beige personally a pre-personal stage. I know in the spiral dynamics, we consider it the first stage, but it's actually to me a pre-personal. Because even in the purple, this sense of unique identity hasn't appeared yet enough. It's the identity of the group that's evident in the purple. And my role in the group is the social bonder. Still again, parenting and caring, but now parenting and caring my tribe, my clan, and taking care of the vulnerable ones, building relations, me with them, and having a special place, special place among them, and even sacrificing for the group, and having pride in this sacrifice, connecting and creating the bonds. And then comes the red, this first stage of unique self independent self, I, a first person perspective. I don't have the capacity to hold multiple perspectives. So what I see is what is, there's nothing else. And the red here becomes the godmother. The godmother, even if it's a male, remember, what's the difference? This is the one that controls through indispensability. I offer myself, to protect myself. I am the power behind the power. I use whatever I can to keep my freedom, my independence, even sex. What does even sex mean here? It's a bit tricky here. Let's talk about, I'm sorry, I'm going a bit fast, but in the questions, I can go a bit deeper if you want. But this is like, for example, uh, it, I mean, metaphorically, you could consider it prostitution but on the unhealthy side. What's prostitution? I am giving my body 
to retain my independence. My power comes through giving you what you need so that I am needed and I'm still free. It's a bit ironic in the red. And this is again what this power behind the power means. I can actually control you by giving you my body or whatever I have to give you to keep myself. It's a bit of paradoxical here in the red. And then the blue, in the blue, the sense of morality, the sense of righteousness comes through serving. And this is actually stereotypically how the two is usually described in the books. Now, it becomes very interesting when we did the stages of the mind, how we started to discover that the Enneagram books and the Enneagram teachers usually describe each type from a stage. So usually the two is described from the blue. And usually the three, the doer, the achiever is described from the orange. I'm talking to an integral community here, so I'm just assuming that everyone knows the colors. So usually the three, the doer, the achiever is described from the orange, but the three is also in the blue. Usually the nine is described from the green. So you will find that there are stereotypes, but this stages of the mind shows us that no, the type is changing shape as it evolves in maturity, in cognitive complexity, in uh, cognitive capacity. So this is what we call the typical Jewish mother, the typical Middle Eastern mother, the typical Italian mother, they're all the same. And that's why I even put three of them just to know that in these traditional societies, they're all the same, the typical Indian mother, the typical Chinese mother, they're all the same, the one that sacrifices her life. And when you ask her, mama, what do you want? I want to see you happy. What is your greatest achievement? My greatest achievement is to see my successful son. Yeah, what about you? No, I have no needs. I'm here to serve you, to take care of you, to help you. And then we move on to the orange. And again, the orange is an agency, not a communion. So we go back to me and we go back to power, but from a higher place. And again, they become the power behind the throne, but now from a place of gain and pleasure and success and enjoying the now and enjoying the future. And we see many, many images of these lovely tools in society, in our modern society, how they have, I, I, I remember reading a statistic and I don't know how accurate it is, that the greatest number of US presidents, we can assume that this is a democratic system. So these are the people that can navigate this very complex political system to reach the top, the president. The type that has had the most US presidents is type nine. And that makes sense. They are the ones that can take all the perspectives and understand what everyone is, done, is doing. And the greatest number of, of first ladies, those that have supported the power on the throne have been the type twos. So the type twos have been the most first lady, these that support the person in power through dedication, through helping or they themselves, the twos have their charm, their lovability, this beautiful sweetheart and then the beautiful mother and they're very seductive. Again, is that good or bad? It depends, is it from up or down? So this seduction from a high place is beautiful, it's inspiring. This seduction from a low place becomes uh, what we call egoistic and becomes, has some pathologies to it. And then in the green, they become the custodians of the world. They serve mother earth. They serve the good of everything. They serve the good of life. And the green is a very dangerous place for type two, extremely dangerous. If they have not learned to build their psychological power and boundaries well in the orange and have a sense of control of their resources, they can be spread thin in the green. They can totally lose their boundaries. They can be abused. They can be sucked out dry. 
because they don't have the capacity to say no for anyone who needs. So it's very important for the type twos to build their psychological maturity and capacity well and work on their inner being before reaching green. Otherwise it becomes a disaster because the, the twos inherent in them is a sense of false abundance. I have treasures that never end. So if they don't te if they don't work on that before the green, they just spread out everything for the world. They give out too much. And it's only in yellow that this altruism of the two, this giving becomes authentic. And they start to realize that the real giving comes from giving myself, taking care of myself, accepting my needs. This becomes an authentic given, giving. And now I can really weigh, see the system, see the connections and give correctly. Balancing in harmony. It was hard getting a picture here for this yellow too. So I got this cycle of creating altruism in action. Hear, hearing, listening, creating, and putting it all in a systemic way and recognizing that this system I'm giving to, I am part of, I'm not separate from. I understand the giving of the, the purple, the giving of the green, the red, the giving of the blue. I understand the giving of all the different levels. And then finally, the turquoise with this true humility. I call the turquoise is the mystic yellow, where now I'm not just intellectually part of the system, I am authentically part of the system, and this humbleness comes in. What I didn't mention is that the disease of the heart of the type two is called pride. I have a sense of pride in being the giver, not the taker authentically in yellow and then in turquoise, I surrender totally this pride to a sense of humbleness and humility. Now, this is just a sample of connecting the Enneagram with the spiral. I mean, I've tried to put so much in such little time. I hope I've been able to serve it enough and not overwhelm you. Uh, and I will not go into the stages of the heart, but I do the same thing, but with the states of consciousness, from the gross, from the low gross, to the higher gross, to the subtle, to the entry level causal, to the higher causal and the witness, and to the non-dual. And I show again the type in all of these, reaching the archetypal levels and the divine effusion levels in, uh, from a spiritual side. And out of these three, I create a three-dimensional model. So I'm sure all of you or most of you are familiar with the uh, Wilbur Combs, with the Wilbur Combs lattice. And I actually have an expansion and a modification on the Wilbur Combs lattice, but I will not go into it here now. This is an integral group. So if I just open this now, we'll be here until for a week. So I'll just say that by putting these three, because these are two dimensions. Once you put the third dimension of the Enneagram into it and you have boxes all over, you start suddenly seeing a new picture and you start suddenly realizing that some of these boxes don't fit in here.